I've been talking to Don's son, Duncan Reeby, who's the CEO of Soccerext. I asked him how people react when he tells them his surname. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, you mean Revy. Uh, but actually it's Reeby. Um, that's the first thing that they react to. And the second thing is 99.9% um, .9 of them, um, especially in the football world, are totally and utterly um, pleased and it's been a great legacy that I've had from my father, um, which has helped me make a touch with a very successful business uh, in Soccer X. As a dad, what was he like? How different was the, the private Don to the public Don? There was not that much difference, unless he was in front of a television camera where he was a bit more guarded. But he was the most generous person. My, my sister quoted, he was a great manager, but he was even greater dad. And he was my hero. Everything I learned from him was amazing. And if I was cock of the walk and on the ceiling and, and being a bit too cocky, he would have me down on the floor in about two minutes. And similarly, if I was on the floor, he would have me up on the ceiling in two minutes. He was a great man manager. You know, I, I felt I was the, the 18th son because um, there was 16 or 17 full internationals at Leeds who also experienced that. But in terms of the private to the public, um, that was just something that was put about and was totally fictitious. Well, we should, uh, I think, in all of this, mention your mum as well, shouldn't we? In, in the fact that she had a massive part to play in Leeds United as well and the stuff that she did for the, for the wives and girlfriends and, and children of, of the other players. Uh, she was an absolutely magnificent uh, mum. She also was brought up in football. So she could trade blows with Dad after a match um, and be just as knowledgeable. Um, she was uh, the sort of mother figure behind the scenes and she picked Dad up when he was low and she put him down when he was getting a bit too big for his boots, which he never did actually. But she was a huge driving force in the family. And um, they're both actually, both unforgettable and, and uh, hugely missed. Did he get low a lot did did what happened at various times in his career affect him deeply uh, i think that obviously it was uh, the disappointments that we had with the great team that we had hurt him then but then his job was then to go in and pick everybody up around him which he did and especially when we lost the treble i think it was 1970 season that's so close to each of them he's not enjoying his night that night and he's not enjoying his steak and his, his beer but um by the time the season came round again, he was telling them they're going to have to go and win everything. And uh, the lads responded and they, they built a camaraderie. And, a, and a, well, I don't know how you can put it, really, a philosophy of togetherness, which is, uh, was quite exceptional. And they were quite an exceptional football team. I think uh, one of the things I read, you can, you can, which was that you could basically understand the togetherness of, of that lead squad, that even, say, 30, 40 years later... They all meet up still, you know, the ones that are still around. It's, it's the whole squad. It isn't just two or three of them. And, and virtually all of them, I think, are still with the, the girl that they were with in, in the early 60s and mid-60s and 70s. Well, they were a great set of lads. They were a great set of lads to start with. And all Dad did was mould them, hopefully help them. Um, but more importantly than that, they were, they were great players. And I, I still haven't seen, I know you talk, everybody talks about the modern day football and all that, but I, I still haven't seen better footballers, certainly in the midfield area, up front, at the back. I mean, they were a great side, but all great characters too. And as you say, it's testimony to the fact that they still get together, they have get-togethers, and they're absolutely uh, marvellous. How much did his own childhood, do you think, affect uh, how he was as a manager throughout his career? Well, I think if, you, if I was being honest, um, because he came from a very poor background and he learned his football in, in the back streets of the houses in Middlesbrough, kicking, um, you know, not footballs, but actually uh, rags tied together as a football up against the wall, he was always uh, conscious of poverty. Um, and he always used to drill it into my sister and I that... Um, you know, you're only as rich as what is in your back pocket, and never, never, you know, <laughs> never, never kept quote my worth with my house in, involved because I've got to live somewhere. So he was always conscious of that, given his upbringing and given the fact that um, he never really was terribly wealthy. And even then, he wasn't terribly wealthy when he went to Dubai in relative terms. I mean, people would say he was at the time. 
and it was a great contract he got there. But that didn't make the millions and millions out of football that, for instance, the lads and lasses are doing today. Good luck to them. But um, it, 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 he was always conscious of it could all end tomorrow. And he was always conscious of that as a player. I mean, my mum used to tell me that, you know, if I got a broken leg tomorrow, this could all be over. Why do you think that his relationship with money then was used by some as a stick with which to beat him? And do you think that it, that would be the case if he was alive and managing today? No, well, first of all, I think it's completely false. Um, and I think if you talk to anybody who knew him, you'd find him one of the most generous people in the, in the whole world. But what he did was he actually got a reputation with the England job because he introduced, I think it was Admiral, um, as the first sponsors of England. And because he was way ahead of his time in, ter in terms of commercial uh, realisation, I think I tell the story in the book of took me on to Elland Road in 1963 when he first taken over, and it was a tip. And he said, in the future, son, this will be executive boxes, it will be fabulous. And I mean, there was nothing. People used to arrive at 10 to 3 and, and go at 5 o'clock. And he, he basically said, this will all change. People will come for an entire day at the football. They'll have lunch here. They'll have... He was way ahead of his time, and he got stick for trying to put advertising on the England shirts. And he wasn't in it for himself. He was in it because he just see, saw that as commercial sense. And he was way, way ahead of his time on that respect. And then when the results didn't go well with England, they used that as the stick to beat him. And then the FA, as was then... Because when you say the FA, they've changed a myriad of times over the last uh, 30 years, um, used it as well. That story in the book about him taking you to Ellen Road is, is fantastic and, and recognising the commercial appeal. And, and then you mentioned the Admiral and the kit thing with England, but he also uh, advocated professional referees, didn't he? He advocated that there shouldn't be um, football league games on a Saturday before England were, were to play European or World Cup qualifiers. Yes, both of those were, were his, uh, his foresight. I mean, he was way ahead of his time in, in what he actually advocated for the football industry. And now, looking back, everything has been adopted. Virtually everything he recommended has been adopted. Which does beg the question, doesn't it, Duncan? Why, you know, when, say, I was growing up as a, as a kid in the, in the late 70s and early 80s, I, I, you know, you sort of get brought up about, on stories of Shankly and Busby and Steen and Nicholson and Paisley. And your dad's name is never on that list. Well, it is amongst the people in the know. The people who are, and in fact, those people that you, with the exception of Bill Nick. I mean, Bill, Bill and Dad weren't as close, but Shanks and Shanks used to ring Dad every Sunday. Uh, Jock Steen was a great, great friend. Sir Matt Busby was on his This Is Your Life at the end. He went over to Sir Matt uh, for the first day as a manager and asked him for half an hour of his time, and Matt gave him a whole day. And he never forgot that, and he subsequently did that with new up-and-coming managers. And, you know, the people who actually, in football, know what really went on, as opposed to the press um, and the publicity he got subsequent to his um, retirement, or sorry, resignation from England, where he was going to get the sack anyway, he had an offer, he then resigned, and you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be told, like Sir Alf Ramsey was, uh, by television that you've got the sack. And that sent everybody to, into a furor. I think one of the big regrets he had was selling it to a national newspaper on an exclusive basis. But there were reasons for that, because the national newspaper in question already knew about it and accepted to keep quiet on, in return for the exclusive. That then put the whole of Fleet Street against him, as was then, and that just fed into the, the vitriol that was then coming from the FA and its uh, incumbent um, president or chairman, who I can't comment on at all. And if there's one manager in the, in the modern game, now it doesn't necessarily have to be working in, in the Premier League, it could be anywhere in the world, but if there's one manager who reminds you of your dad, who would it be? Alex Ferguson, or Sir Alex, should I say. Why? Um, because <clears throat> he understands what makes a football team tick. He understands and has an eye for a, a good player that can make a great player. And he has a work ethic and an ability to man-manage great players, mediocre players and poor players and get another 50% out of them. 
And um, his longevity is, is an absolute miracle. I mean, how he's done that, I don't know. Duncan Reevey talking to me earlier on.